The third C of competence actually has three C's within it. And we're going to see, again, the state of being, the way we are during this phase is going to be crucial to our longevity. So being of service, being of collaborative, and being cash attentive are ways that correspond with these three <coughs> C's that I have embedded within competence to share with you. If we go back to Peter Drucker, uh, who reminded us that uh, the only results in business were external. There's no internal results. There's only internal efforts and costs. The only thing we really can measure as a result is outside with our customers. And we start from that premise. What I propose in terms of differentiating customer value fundamentally means how are we exchanging that value with our customers? What is it they value and can we do it profitably? To do that requires an internally highly communicating culture. You know, the, the Founders Mentality is a recent book that was produced also by the same consultants for some of the data you saw before on the uh, lifespan of businesses. And they surveyed business founders who felt that their strategies were perfectly fine, but if their businesses failed, 85% of the reason for the failure was on internal reasons. That it, it, it was the staff, it was the team. People didn't get it done inside. It had nothing to do with what I determined on the outside was necessary for the business. And I think that that registers a crisis of communication inside companies. And I know as a former CEO, I always felt that my business was 50 million and we had subsidiary operations in many countries in the world. And I always had this nagging sense of not, not knowing what I needed to know. That there was this gap, no matter how hard I pursued it. And I think that it's, it's important for us to recognize running a business that there's a lot that you don't know what's happening. And so you've got to institute a highly communicating culture in order to generate that. And then the third criteria, and I'll explore these in depth briefly, is to have an accessible cash flow. I often find when talking to family businesses that there's only one or two people on the management team from the family that actually understand the finances, and I try to get everybody to understand the cash implications. It creates a better unity and a better team atmosphere among the family. So let's explore these just briefly in depth. First of all, the differentiated customer value. Uh, when we take the word differentiated, I, there's two pieces to that. To me, there's there's being distinctive and then there's being detectable. The detectable part is because today, as, as you all know, you're bombarded with signals on a regular basis and how do you determine the, the signals that you want to receive from all the noise that's coming at you. We've got to make sure that we're skilled in that sense. But this idea of being distinct or being a service beyond and the use of the icon with the eye in it is the informational layer that we add on top of what it is we do for our customers. If we're in a business to business relationship, yes, we may have products that we supply, services that we supply, and that may contain how it is we view our relationship with our customers. And I'm suggesting to my clients and to you that unless you're thinking about the information that you can also supply your business to business customer on top of what you provide, that helps them run their businesses better, you're not moving along the competitive track to staying ahead of your, your competitors. That we've got to supply them information about how they're doing in their business to keep the business with us. As it applies to customer and external assets, I also try to transfer the thinking from internal assets, which has always been our norm, the thinking of each customer relationship as one of the assets on which the business is built. And if any one of those assets is not generating profit, or we're not doing enough for them to generate profit, that's where our asset focus needs to be. It's a little bit of an outside-in perspective, but I think that in this fast-moving world, if we don't have such a perspective, we're not likely to remain in competition very long. And then finally, as it, as it applies to value, we have to continually test offers with customers to see if what it is we're doing is valid for them. We have to continually experiment by putting tested offers in front of our customers to, to follow their track, if you will, to follow their guidance as to where their needs and requirements are moving. I think most of us would recognize that if there were a way to simplify what we're talking about in terms of strategy, it would be, there'd be three questions. What's your objective? Where are you gonna play? Who are you gonna try to serve? And what makes you think you're gonna do that better than your competitor? If you answer those three questions, you're on your way to formulating a strategy in at least the simplest sense of, of the term. Now we can choose to be inside or outside as we take that further, 
if we're looking at it from more of a for us point of view on the inside, if in determining our objective, we're actually identifying what the future looks like in terms of a pro forma, in other words, that 24 month horizon for the business, what would that P&L look like? And what resources are we going to need if that's what we expect to accomplish? These are questions that we have to answer on the inside. In terms of scope, where we're gonna play, who we're gonna serve, what are we not gonna do? This is often the threshold that, that capsizes many businesses, to be firm about that. And then lastly, for market share. I don't think I have a client that can tell me with precision as to what market share that they really enjoy. And if you don't know what your market share is, you're not knowing enough about what's happening in your market, in your industry. Today, if you're not, for publicly traded companies, if you're not growing at least at the pace of the market you're serving or better, you're on your way to demise. <coughs> That's what the data is beginning to show. But I think more importantly, as far as these three questions, as, as we apply them on the outside of the business, when it comes to objective, who could be our customer? Do we have the marketplace mapped out sufficiently to know what our choices are? Secondly, if we have mapped out the marketplace as to who the customers could be for us, then to select the targets from that map and say these are the ones who should be. And what makes us think that they should be? Where is the value proposition that we so closely hold on to that aligns itself so clearly with what we know about these target companies? Do we have that exchange identified with great clarity? Oftentimes not. And then finally, with that, who else wants these customers? Who else wants to eat our lunch, so to speak? And what are we going to have to do to make sure that we get to eat our lunch and enjoy this profitable relationship with this customer? All questions that we need to dig in with our clients. And then as we look at something I've developed for clients, I call the great circle of marketing action, which basically covers all of the things that you would consider to be of marketing interest to a company. These are the first three questions that we need to ask. The segmenting of the market is the map of the market. Targeting is the selection of who we're going to serve. And then how are we going to compete against those who we're going to run into when we try to serve those guys? as we move on from differentiated customer value to this highly communicating culture. When people are working together inside a company, what they're really trying to do is coordinate action. If we boil down the essence of the work that happens inside a company, when it's done right, we've coordinated actions among each other to get that value exchanged with our customers. And where businesses fail, they fail mainly in this inability to communicate and coordinate action. And I think that when we're talking about stepping up the coordinating of our actions with inside the company, we really need a system for that. Many businesses don't have a system for that. I don't know how to make my people communicate better with each other other than to implore them to. I don't know what else to do. The one I've used ever since serving in my role as CEO and that I continue to guide with my clients is this idea of, of SOAP. And the acronym stands for Situation, Objective, plan of action, and execution. What often happens, I believe, in companies is that when we discover a crisis or, or just a problem in front of us, many of us in business are, are, are fix it fast people. That's what got us into it in the first place. So we jump to the objective. This is where we're gonna go. And we hand it off to somebody else to develop an action plan for it. Give it off to staff. What I believe is missing from that that is now more crucially important than ever before because of the complexity in our, in our new world circumstances is to sit down and to assess the situation together. Are we drawing in all of the necessary inputs from people on the team that will help us to understand what are we really facing right now and how did we get to that point where this is what we're, we're confronted with? This, this is a skip over point for many businesses many businesses that I know, many businesses that I've worked in, many that you know. We jump to fix before really assessing where we are. One of the things, uh, I, I served in uh, rescue operations in the Coast Guard and I was involved in communication. And <clears throat> if communications broke from someone in distress, as long as we had the answer to one question, it was something we could move into action to do. Any idea what that question would be? Sorry? Where are you? Exactly. 
And I think that so often happens, we presume where we are in business and don't get all of the perspectives from people on the team who have a unique piece of the answer to where we are and how it is we got here that needs to be explored. We have to take some time for that. But when we do take the time for that, the objectives that we ultimately determine for where to go from that are usually far better, far more precise, far more well, far more well ingrained. Then we move into action planning, which is the next place where we don't do a lot of good detail work, where we must if we're going to use this as a system. Now you can take this SOAP approach and you can apply it to any one of the cycles of activity that commonly characterize a business. You can have the people who are responsible for making the offering in the first place apply the system, all the way down to the back end of the process where you're assessing your results and determining what resources you need to go forward to the next frame. And all points in between. It's a system for getting people to communicate, coordinate action, and pursue uh, a more successful outcome for business. Now we move down to the third one in the competence area, which is this idea of if we are going to continue with this business, we've got to be a whole lot more attentive to cash. I think cash is the great truth serum. But when I have my new clients and they, they, they tell me what they're interested in working on, if I were to give you a, a survey, a synopsis of my personal experience, I would tell you that their first concern is top line growth, more sales, more wood on the fire, more gas. Secondly, gross profit in absolute terms, pounds, dollars, euros, whatever the case may be. And then net income. But if you were to take where their focus is most of the time and create a pie chart for it, I'd tell you this would probably be in the 70, 80 percentile. And then, okay, maybe 10% maybe here, 10% here. But, but it's, it's all about jamming growth. All we read about is this idea of pursuing growth. And sometimes I think it's almost obsession. Whereas the thing I try to get them to shift their focus on is to first be concerned about cash. Because I believe all opinions aside, ultimately cash is the is the truth in the business, accessible cash. Then contribution margin percent, because that's the first threshold of our performance, the variable result. And then lastly, top line growth in relation to the industry or the market that we're serving. Not top line growth for double digits sake, top line growth to say that we are at or better than those we're competing with in the marketplace that we actually serve. And that's why we need to pay attention to market share, just to reinforce that previous point. And so I promised you a couple of methods as well as ideas. Here's a method that I use with my clients. And the, the purpose for it is to create a simpler understanding to get from that emphasis on top line down to the bank balance that improved this year as a consequence of all the hard work I did in owning and running this business. And it's a simple P&L for the most part. And I call it the return on work because in many cases I've got clients who after a, a whole hard years, a hard years of work, doesn't have a whole lot to show for it that they can point to or talk to their spouses and families and other, other family members about and say, look at the, the nice tangible rewards we've accomplished as a result of all this good hard work. So I talked about contribution margin percent before which is the first threshold of concern. And then I talk about the fixed spend rate, which is after everybody gets paid, including the tax man, including ourselves as owners, after everybody gets paid, what's left here? But that isn't the final answer either because working capital requirements in the business often soaks up all the profitability in the business and leaves us without anything accessible in terms of cash. It all feels kind of invisible to us. It all just kind of disappears. You know, one person sits down and works at the cash flow statement. The rest of the family members, it's, it's like, it's, it's missed. I don't see it, I don't get it, I don't understand it, I don't feel good about it. So what we end up here, if in fact we can actually, after all the working capital requirements, after everybody gets paid, look at the bank balance in terms of points of cash, or how much is it in, in relation to the sales figure for this year that we can actually look at as a return on our work. It's just another way, it's not a new P&L, but it's just a new way of getting more people within the family to be aware of the fruits of our labors. Because if they do that, then they're talking with each other more. And that's a crucial aspect of family business relations that falls down. If I don't understand the business, and I don't feel like somebody's telling me about it, that's where the divisions and the sensitivities and some of the wounds come to the surface. 
and things come apart. So it's a method to try to treat the family as well as the business.